Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I have two special guests with me. Um, they are experts in the business of entertainment. Uh, between the two of them, they have uh, they have represented, I mean, huge, numerous, huge, huge names in the industry. I, I won't even get into the list. They, they can do that uh, when they speak, but it's, it's just an honor to have these two individuals who are taking out the time of their busy schedule to help us here um, learn about the music business and what it's going to look like moving forward. Uh, help me welcome my special guest first on the list. Uh, he's the author of the, urban er, uh, the Business of Urban Music and the managing partner of Walker and Associates, Mr. James Walker uh -oh, Jr. We lose you? And entertainment attorney and lecturer and the daughter of uh, R&B legend, <laughs> or uh, Frankie Beverly, Miss the lovely Miss Heather Beverly. Please help me welcome them to the show. Heather, James, how you guys doing? Well, well thank you for having me. How are you? Doing well, doing well. I'm so glad you guys were able to join me. Uh, we, we, we have to, before we get into the content of the business of music, I definitely want to start with this um, crisis that we've been seeing in our land. Um, and, and just a month ago, when you said that you thought COVID, Corona, but just over the last week right. or two, it's turned into uh, racism in America. Um, and it is truly a crisis. Um, Heather, you're, you're a, a native of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, yeah. I, wanna get your, I wanna get your thoughts on just days ago, George Floyd was murdered at the at the hands, or, or should I say, the knee of a cop right. uh, in Minneapolis. What what went through your mind when you heard the news? You know, it was um, unbelievable, regardless of where you're from, um, to think that we just time after time are still reliving what seems to be the same story over and over again. Just a a different precious life, a different precious face, and another grieving family um, and group of friends. And what just doesn't even make sense to me in this day to even be a thing. Like, I just can't wrap my mind around it. Adding to it that I'm from Minneapolis, which is ironically a melting pot. I mean, I was watching um, CNN and Michael Eric Dyson said was talking about Minneapolis and he just described it so well because he was just, and he was accurate. It is a melting pot. It is a place where uh, people of all races, all sexual orientations, all religions intermingle all of the time. I mean, my mom is Irish. My, you know, half of my family are mixed backgrounds. Um, you know, there's a strong interconnectedness in the community. So to then think that, by the way, not only am I from Minneapolis, but this incident happened three blocks up the street from where I grew up on the same street. So I used to live on that street. I used to be in that area as a child all the time. And to think that something like that is happening, and I'm sorry, there's no other way to explain the heinousness of that other than the fact that he's black. So, I, you know, it's devastating to me. And, you know, I'm here in Atlanta. I've lived in Los Angeles. It's like I, I have to turn off the news sometimes. I'm literally watching everywhere I've ever lived, you know, being burned to the ground or just full of unrest. And I understand it, um, but it's just, for me, it's just, it's, it's quite sad. Wow, wow. You both are Georgians and um, I guess, all of America is upset. I think everybody's feeling the frustration and uh, they're just frustrated and, and frankly speaking, tired <laughs> of, of the injustice. Um, James, for, for you guys there, what are your thoughts on the response of, of many of our civilians in Georgia, Los Angeles, and some of the other cities that have kind of taken this matter into their own hands, if you will? Yes, I'm very disappointed in some of our uh, citizens. I'm also a little concerned for our black businesses because Atlanta is a black town. And if you're out here burning up stuff versus burning up the system, as some of the rap artists said and Killer Mike said and the mayor said, we should focus on the system, not burning up our own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And we own our own building. We own our own building. I thought I was going to have to come board up my building this weekend. And that's sad when you think people I stand with and fight for, Heather fights for, now we might be a target 
and have our come and work today and the building be burnt up wow. because we were only maybe four or five miles from downtown Atlanta where all of that was going on. I drove through Buckhead Monday night and I, it just broke my heart to see Del Frisco's and other restaurants boarded up and banks with broken windows and cops all over the mall because they had, I guess, got into the malls and Phipps Plaza. And it just breaks your heart. I think we're fortunate that we have a great leader in Keisha Lance Bottoms. You know, that's mm -hmm. the one thing we have here that I'm yes. very, very grateful for. Amazing. But it, it really pains my heart to see these images and to see young people out here of all colors, all hue, all shades, all sizes out here just tearing up things just because. Hmm. Wow. You, just yesterday, we had a blackout, you know, and uh, a big part of that was the music industry, uh, where two ladies, uh, executives, decided to put this movement together and to pause all, all business as it pertains to music. Uh, in those efforts, why are, why are efforts like that so important in this time? And I, either of you can answer. Um, I'll let Heather go first. Okay. Thanks, James. Um, I want to make sure everybody knows that though the industry paused, it was really more of a business is not as usual sort of moment because um, we weren't off. Uh, I actually joined a Zoom conversation that was being had uh, by artists, uh, managers, attorneys on, and it was just a huge dialogue all day, different segments of industry um, participants came together on this Zoom call that was orchestrated, it was amazing, um, to really talk about how do we effectuate change? How are we each being affected in our different areas of the industry? Um, and how do we start to effectuate change? And the conversation ranged from everything from just educating ourselves more on how to do the business properly to analyzing the analytics and being able to present numbers as to our effectiveness and the significance of our contributions to the industry and even all the way to forming a union perhaps, but it was just an interesting dialogue. So while people may not have been able to get me on the phone to talk about their current contract or uh, for a consultation or something, um, <laughs> there was dialogue being had that was meaningful and very important. So I'm, I'm very proud of us as an industry for how we uh, handled yesterday. And then let me chime in Cornell and thank Heather and a guy named Shannon Johnson, who's a mentor of mine out in LA we were scheduled for a call yesterday and my office did, as Heather knows, the pre-call call to see if we were set to go. And Shannon said to me Monday, he said, James, here in LA, we're closed down for entertainment on Tuesday. And I had been running all weekend with my kids. My son is a baseball player. He had hurt his shoulder, a minor injury. So we were doing the whole doctor's thing when we found a therapist for him yesterday to get him back normal with his pitching and everything. So I didn't, I was unaware. And then I saw Heather's posts and a couple other posts and I reposted them. And I took the day, a lot of people don't know this Cornell, but I work with a lot of the civil rights families. I worked with Malcolm X's family, Ilyasa Shabazz. I've worked with uh, Dr. King's family. We did the autobiography of Coretta Scott King. I worked with Dick Gregory's family. We did the estate cleanup when Dick Gregory died, who was my beloved uh, fraternal brother and just an icon to my life. So I took the day trying to call some of those families, Bernice King, uh, text out to Ayanna Gregory, trying to ask them, what do we do as entertainment lawyers? My civil rights fight is in the music industry, getting artists freed from bad contracts, getting artists paid for royalties that are past due. That's kind of been my fight for 20 years, which I call my little civil rights battle for black folks. But what do we do when it's a matter like this. I looked at 42 USC section 1983, which is the civil rights, a civil action for deprivation and police brutality. I tried to look at the statute. I spoke to a group from West Point that they're pulling together black men from West Point, trying to do some great work and women from West Point. So that was my thing yesterday. And I think Heather and I think Channing for reminding us to take a pause because Heather, you know, we all go nonstop. <laughs> and we tend to forget, like, there's a bigger world out here than the entertainment industry, believe it or not. So that's what I did yesterday. I'm waiting for Bernice King to call me back because I want to ask her, what is the King, King Center thinking yeah. we should do, not just here, but globally? And she's one of my 
dearest friends, having worked closely with her on her mother's autobiography. Wow, wow. You both have an uh, extensive background in the judicial system. And many are saying, we got to change our judicial system. We got to change our laws. Um, how can we uh, effectively do that? Um, we know voting is one part of it, but is there a way to really establish a change in the judicial system and how Blacks are treated? Oh. Uh, Heather, I'll let Heather go. I, I have some thoughts. I'm sorry, I'm Heather. I'm happy today. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, He's it's heavy. not heavy. It's on point. It's it, that alone is a its own live session. But uh, go ahead, Jess. I'll let you start. I think for so long we've screamed, "Vote, vote, 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 vote." I watched the Michelle Obama documentary on Monday on Netflix, and I was so inspired more about what they did. Uh, in office and her constant out here, you know, on the front line, getting people to register to vote. And I think that's one answer, but I think we gotta go even bigger. We gotta look at Nike. You have a multi-billion dollar company. What are you really doing in our inner cities besides making my nephews and nieces want 100, 200 pair of sneakers, $200 sneakers from their Uncle James. And mm -hmm. of course I'm not buying them, Heather, but <laughs> what is Nike doing? Um, what can we do as entertainment related people, executives, lawyers, artists, to help get away from this celebrity, 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 be a ball player, be a rapper, be on a reality show, and get back to really, really focusing on our city and our communities. Because if the people are burning stuff down, what they're telling you is we don't have our fair share of the pie. And we feel like we gotta go be a rapper, or be on these reality shows, throwing tea and coffee and everything, fighting each other, or we gotta be a ball player. That's the images. Um, as you know, I've done TV work like Heather, and I always used to say to the networks, like, we're the black folks. We're the black female legal analysts. I like to see Heather on Fox or CNN more, or ABC more, so that people can see other images right. of what we do as a collective, not just dribble the basketball or sing yes. the rap. Or, or play football on a field. And I think I hold all of us accountable. The Nikes, the media companies, how many times are they gonna run this video? You know, all of the stuff they show. Also, we look at the police. Of course, we all know that it's 5%, 10% bad apples. It's not everybody, we know that. I have uncles that were cops, my dad was a cop. We know it's not everybody, but we know they also have their duty. That, that's kind of how I felt this week. Like, what could we do as entertainment to shift away from our role models being so big with the Diddy's, the Jay-Z's, the whatever, whatever. And I applaud Jay-Z for calling the governor of Minnesota and for his taking out ads in the paper. Watching him evolve, I'm hoping other artists and other entertainment business brands like his will see the need to get there and really help us um, take it away from just voting because there's more to it than just voting. That's mm -hmm. one part of it, but it's a whole collective. Okay, we elect people in office, but Nike, you got a billion dollars over here. I think it's wonderful Michael Jordan issued a statement, but I want to see us investing a commitment of five or 10% of those profits back into these cities that wear those sneakers. That's what mm -hmm. I would like to see. Five I or 10%. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I was gonna say, you bring up such a good point because at the end of the day, while yes, there are changes that need to be made systematically, and both James and I come from litigation backgrounds, so we have both been a part of that system, the judicial system, but quite frankly, let's not forget that our government systems are influenced by corporate lobby. And so when we see right now how many corporations today have posted uh, and bragged about all of the black organizations that they have invested in or sent uh, donations to or provided some funding for. There's this big movement now that corporations that otherwise probably never even thought about it are putting, you know, now they're advertising how much money they've donated to what this cause or that cause um, that are involved, you know, black businesses, black causes, et cetera. And so what happens is that when you do have, make an economic difference um, and you start to, as James said, start to empower us economically, start to show and engage those of us with certain levels of education, certain levels of um, income, 
and we start to mobilize to either build our own or to create different infrastructures within other corporate environments, um, have the strength to speak up. There was someone on that collective industry call yesterday who was like, look, there's a lot of you on this call who work for these major media companies and major en entertainment companies who don't think you can speak up, who are afraid to say something if you see something wrong systematically within your own organization. Um, those types of things need to change. And so, you know, the power of the dollar and the power of the statistic, you know, the way that we consume everything as a community is, I mean, it's, it's a trigger point. <laughs> it's, it, it's meaningful to the GFP. So we've got to figure out a way to start utilizing the power we have because we're not powerless as a community at all. Mm. So good, guys. We got some work ahead of us, but I believe together mm -hmm. we can we can definitely make it happen for sure. Yeah. Let's get into uh, our topic of the music business uh, moving forward. Um, you guys have a wealth of knowledge to offer, but I want to give our listeners a little background into uh, your start in the industry. So, Heather, let's. How did you get into uh, the entertainment industry? Uh, two second version since it was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I need to use words now that don't date myself completely. Um, but little background, like you said, I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, and uh, went to college actually with an idea that I was going to be in advertising and work on, you know, work in New York and have my own agency, maybe on Park Avenue or something. So I went to the University of Wisconsin undergrad and majored in business. And that my undergraduate degree is marketing and um, communications. And so I kind of wanted a secondary um, I wanted like a postgraduate degree of some sort. I felt like it might give me an edge in business, uh, but was so over the business curriculum. I was like, if I see one more statistics class or accounting class at just a, with a higher number, it's not 101, it's 701. I thought I might, uh, you know, jump out a window. So um, started looking at options, decided that law school might be, an, having a law degree might be an additional um, strength to my overall package and, you know, that it would maybe help not only educate me if I want to be an entrepreneur, give me some things that I might need, but it might also um, set me apart a little bit as navigating through the business world. Well, after going to law school, um, and I went to law school in Chicago, uh, I actually loved the curriculum, started thinking about what areas of law I might practice, uh, having come from a marketing background. I played competitive tennis. Uh, young, I love sports, avid sports fanatics, thought maybe I could do endorsement contracts with athletes, think that kind of thing. But I was really on a, it, the exploration of this thing sort of evolved. Um, longer story, shorter, I had to work in my first year of law school, which uh, for folks who don't know, in law school, they tell you, you can't work. Uh, you must focus on your studies. Well, uh, mom, I'm not trying to call you out if you're watching, because I'm sure you are. But she wasn't writing the check to just say, be there, live downtown Chicago, have at it, buy $1,000 books and, you know, go forth. Um, so I had to work in my first year of law school. And it just so happened I was able to uh, have an opportunity to work for some entertainment lawyers. And that was really where I knew this works. It brings in my business background, my marketing background, um, the law. And I was in Chicago, which wasn't considered a major market, I don't know why, but to the world, if you weren't in New York or LA, now Atlanta, but back then, it was New York or LA, uh, or maybe Nashville, um, then you just weren't doing it at all. So um, I just took it upon myself because those were the days of, here we go, date yourself, of, you know, Kanye was still producing only and Common and people like Twista and Do or Die and Crucial Conflict and R. Kelly. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was big business and music in Chicago, though it still wasn't getting credit for the music business side. Um, and I just started going where I could to be seen and I knew how to market myself. And so I uh, first worked for a lawyer that was not in entertainment once I got licensed. And 
I decided, you know, at the end of the day, I need to learn how to be a good lawyer first. So I actually did, again, to your point earlier, I was working for a very prominent criminal defense attorney and litigator uh, in Chicago. We worked on ward redistricting litigation. We worked uh, for some of the highest ranking gang members in the city we were representing, as well as attorneys who had ethical issues and problems. So I worked with a very, very prominent attorney who gave me my chops in litigation and eventually um, hustled hard enough to launch an entertainment practice. And that was 20 little uh, years ago. <laughs> I can't even say that. I, I carried my grandfather's toolbox up until the age I was 14, went on to Howard, then went to Howard Law. That's kind of my story compared to that wonderful testimony by Heather. That's the gist of what that, I can say. Like, that cult, you, there's so many wonderful entertainment lawyers that come out of Howard. You guys have like this whole little thing, I, you know. I'm we still all, up from Minnesota trying to figure it yeah. out. <laughs> we, we were all trained by a guy named Spencer H. Boyer, a professor mm -hmm. of ours. And I was doing shows before Tyler Perry blew up, um, David Tauber, Shelly Garrett. I was promoting all these shows up and down the East Coast, doing all the concerts and parties at Howard. Diddy was as well. I would do the step shows. He would do the parties. And then Phyllis Hyman one day just told me you should think about being an entertainment lawyer. And I had See? never heard the word before. <laughs> I had never heard the word before. I was promoting her in concert, two shows, did very well with one show, bombed on the other. And um, Phyllis said, have you ever thought about entertainment law? She said, what are you gonna do with your Howard Law, your Howard undergrad degree? Cause I was graduating from Howard undergrad. And I said, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be a civil rights lawyer. I'm gonna fight for my people. And I was all amped up, you know, power. I'm gonna be Thurgood Marshall. We're gonna go in here and do something. And she said, we don't have enough black entertainment. And I was like, wow. And I thought, do they dance? Do they sing? Because you know, you're thinking entertainment lawyer. And she <laughs> said, no, they do our contracts. They look over our contracts and most of our lawyers are Jewish guys. The nice guys, but the Jewish guys, we don't have people of color. And that just stuck with me. So a year later, I applied to Howard. I look now and wonder how I got in because I was just an average student in undergrad, but I guess my entrepreneurial work uh, got me in the door. And once I got there, I was still promoting plays. I was in class studying, and my advertisements were running on HUR radio and KISS FM while I was in class. And I remember my teacher saying, I heard your ad, and I understand you're writing up your own contracts, which is illegal because you're not an attorney. You need to let me see these contracts you're doing. So he took me in, sat me down, walked me through how to do entertainment contracts, and came out of law school, and it just took off. I mean, it just I knew from day one this was my calling. Um, and focused a lot on raising the kids. Now they're all graduated. They don't need me anymore. So now I can focus on law full time. But um, yeah, I've had a great career. I've had a great career. I've worked with, as Heather has too, we've worked with some wonderful, incredible people. And the thing I want to say is we see them beyond the veil. Like people see our artists on TV, they see them in their books, their films, their specials, their stage appearances, their concerts. But we deal with them when it's midnight and their kid is flunky. And they're like, James, I can't get this boy to go to school. I got a nanny. I got a tutor. I got a mentor. I'm over here making all this money. Everybody knows me, but my kids ain't doing right. Or they got a kid that's, you know, maybe not paying their bills and they're carrying their whole family. And we deal with that kind of stress of being their advisor in those kind of private confidential times off the stage, off the field, wow. outside of the book. Uh, signing and all that stuff. So uh, it's it's a blessing. I, I don't take it lightly. I know, Heather, I know you feel as well. Sometimes we're therapists. Sometimes we're uh, family therapists. Sometimes yeah. we're uh, marriage counselors. Yeah. You know, they so. do it all. Wow. But, um, but it's, a, wow. it's a wonderful thing to do. And I've, I've had a great journey. We have a building here in Atlanta now. We're staffing up and just having a lot of fun. Wow. Well, it brings us to this uh, conversation of coronavirus or COVID-19. And uh, we saw the whole country just come to a pause. Um, and for many on my end, you know, we, we saw it turn into, oh, I couldn't go to my, I know like many in my area, we, we were we were looking for uh, Mrs. Anita Baker to come through and she hadn't been through yet. And now we like, Corona, she ain't, she ain't coming at all now. But, but uh, that has 
caused a, a <laughs> pause on <laughs> right. It caused a pause on the the large uh, venues gathering and concert and all that stuff. But I'm sure it's affected other areas in the industry. Uh, give us a little glimpse into how this has affected um, the industry as a whole. Shall I begin? Yeah, sure. Yes, okay. it's your turn. I don't want to hog up the. Um, it's no turn. Um, but yeah, so it, first of all, the fact that the coronavirus pandemic almost seems today to be something years ago in time, just because uh, all of the things that we're dealing with today um, with the civil unrest and the protesting and everything else that's plaguing our news, um, it's, it's weird. It just, to me, seems like a lifetime ago that we began dealing with the industry freeze, right? Um, and, you know, when, when Corona hit, I mean, it had a very significant effect immediately on the entertainment industry, particularly the music industry, um, and particularly, obviously, for touring artists, uh, Broadway, um, people uh, doing uh, that were doing uh, like appearances, anything live, anything in person was like shut down. Um, and even the streaming market went down about almost 10% in the first month. Um, and I always, I always say that, you know, that's because all those kids came home and their parents were making them sit in the living room and pay, play Scrabble and other board games and talk and things that people don't ever do. And then Luckily, streaming came back and has pretty much almost recovered since. But I think that's because those kids were like, OK, mom, enough, and went back to their rooms. <laughs> um, but obviously, in an age of a pandemic where people end up stuck in their homes, a lot of not just music, not just entertainment, but a lot of things uh, come to a huge halt. Um, I will say, and we'll talk and we'll talk more about the actual effects it's had on the industry in terms of numbers and all of that, which uh, and advertising spending and you know radio was struggling and you know all kinds of things in the in initial panic of it all. But I will say that you know I, it would be remiss if I didn't that we are so blessed to be in this business because what James and I were talking about even before we came on live is that we are very busy. It's an industry that despite the pandemic, there's a lot going on. I mean, we have a tremendous amount of business to do, whether it's dealing with the panic of certain things that are happening in the touring industry, or whether it's everyone scrambling now to create new content for the gaps that are gonna exist, whether it's in film and television that stopped production, um, or whether it's uh, in music and a lot of artists have put back their releases because they can't promote in the traditional way they were used to, um, or whether it's the scramble to create what the new normal will be. And I know I'm sure James does, I do, all of my colleagues, everyone is adjusting quickly to figure out, okay, so how do we still do this thing in a virtual world? Um, and even my colleagues, you know, I've had the pleasure and choice, <laughs> though people thought it was crazy, I've worked from home for about 15 years. So this whole work from home, be quarantine type of thing is not new for me. I always found it more productive, more efficient, less time in traffic, less stress. Uh, and at the end of the day, wasn't trying to uh, um, spend all the money on the marble foyer and my name and, you know, silver letters behind my head. Um, but as people adjust, I think we're becoming more productive. Uh, I'm an optimist, so you see how I jumped into that, but I know we'll finish on the negatives, but I just think that, you know, there are days I can't even, right? Uh, I, I mean, and there are new breakout stars. There's new, there are new players in the industry who are burgeoning, people with amazing new business models to handle this issue uh, that are on the forefront. And so our industry goes on and I'm grateful to be in it because so many people uh, are trying to figure out how they're going to feed their families and themselves and survive. So 
Um, there's a lot of damage to the business, but I just, I can't overlook the fact that there are so many blessings being in a business that can survive through something like this. James, how's it been from your vantage point? It's, it's been a tale of two cities. On um, one extent, as Heather and I talked about prior, we've been very swamped because we're still doing wills and estate planning. We're still doing um, music contracts, licensing, all types of things, filing motions and different litigation matters that we have open. But what's also been very uh, a different city is those artists who had lined up tours, album releases. Uh, we had to shut down two films. So now we got to redo all the contracts because in your film contract, you'll say Cornell is going to appear as an actor on May 1st through May 20th to shoot this film. Well, COVID won't allow us to shoot. So now we got to go back in and do these agreements. And we also got to have COVID-19 related language. Yes. So that's been very tough to have to redo everything. And then watching my artists who we say this all the time in the gospel industry, I said this um, years ago, and Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're probably 10 to 20% who can take six months off. The other 80, 90%, they're living kind of month to month, if not week to week on their church gig, their tour dates. They might get four or five tour dates a month, spot dates, and then they might be a minister of music at a church. Well, we can't go to church. So some of them are not getting their full pay if they're at a smaller or mid-sized church. If they're at a mega church, they got some of the government money, they might be okay. But at the smaller churches that have to say, hey, we can't pay you a thousand dollars a week anymore. We know you're a well-known artist, but we can't pay you that 4,000 a month right now because giving is down in some places. So that tale of the city has been tough for me to watch as I know these artists have to feed their family. And in many cases, they take care of their extended family, not just their husband or their wife and kids, but they're taking care of their parents, their sister, they got a cousin on payroll, they got an old friend from the neighborhood that's the road manager, and they got another person who's managing them as an artist who's in their inner circle, and they're taking care of all these people. So that's been very, very hard to see. I tried to encourage some to consider the streaming thing, but we're running into a little red tape there, Heather, with publishing issues on Instagram and other places. So we got to have that conversation with the publishing uh, companies as well as Instagram and Facebook so that these concerts can go live and not get shut down because, and I know now everybody's working their way around it, but that's been really hard for me to see. And I feel almost helpless because no matter how brilliant you may think you are as a legal mind, if a church is not open right now, a client can't get paid. There's nothing to renegotiate. If the tour is shut down because venues are closed, there's nothing I can negotiate. You, you follow me? So yeah. that's been very hard to watch. And I know my heart artists are not hurting just for themselves, but they're hurting because they carry their families and they've always been the winner in their family. So they're struggling emotional wise, depression wise with, I can't do for my mom right now. Mm -hmm. I can't do for my sister, my management, my road management. And that's hard. That's hard. And I don't have an answer for that. I think the adjustment from this is going to be what Kirk Franklin and Fred Hammond did Sunday with that concert. You're going to see more of those events come forward. And I think the public is going to appreciate the down to earth nature of it and say, okay, we don't mind giving to your cash out because this is wonderful that you're bringing this concert right in my living room and you're not asking for $45. You're asking for $5 or $10 if 100,000 people tune in, which is great, or whatever you can give, yeah. which is great yeah. to some type yeah. of charitable cause. I think we're gonna see more of that. And I'm hoping entertainment lawyers will kind of set down their gauntlets and join forces and put together these kind of events. I know Heather's cool like that, but some of our colleagues, we need prayer because mm -hmm. some won't put down their gauntlet and say, hey, I got this big name artist. You got that big name artist. We both know they're struggling a little bit. Let's bring them together, put our heads together and figure out how we can do either a joint production or a joint concert or just a joint Q&A session. And yeah. hopefully in the right spirit, people give to our clients and everybody wins. Yeah. Wow. Heather, you, you alluded to the numbers uh, amid the coronavirus. Give us some glimpse of what those specific numbers look like. Um, well, as I was saying, in the first month of the pandemic hitting, 
uh, I mean, even streaming was down, you know, seven to nine percent um, just in one month. I mean, 50 percent of the music business is uh, revenues are generated from live performance. So look, we are now in June and think of all of the summer tours, think of all of the festivals, think of all of the, uh, again, record releases that then get affected by 50% of the revenues already going away from live performance. Um, it has a trickle down effect. So economically, it is severely impacting the industry. Um, and even the numbers of, you know, I looked at, I remember I was watching something and I saw a Sirius XM commercial and they were talking about how to stream Sirius XM at home. Well, Sirius XM provides a large number of revenues uh, through an organization called Sound Exchange who collects that for artists and record labels. Well, it didn't even occur to me until I saw the commercial. Wait a minute, that's yet another revenue stream that's going away for mm -hmm. clients because Who's in their car? Nobody. <laughs> and where do we listen to Sirius XM? Right. And I, what I remember is when I first got Sirius XM uh, uh, in my car, I remember, I think, and again, I'm always, I'm just constantly dating myself today, but whatever, uh, wisdom. Um, <laughs> I remember they had like some kind of at-home feature, but I think it was like a box or something. And I was like, oh, that's something you got to connect. It was like a whole nother apparatus so who had that? Not me. Um, and so to see them advertising how to do it from home. Um, and then you think about all of these different services whether, or platforms that are offering free trials and free this and free that. You have to remember they're trying to call you to the cons consuming that sort of um, content that way. But it's also because there's a gap in their revenues. They're losing revenues, which again, it trickles down. Um, and it's not even just about the you know, the artists, well, shoot, the managers only get 20% or so of what the artist makes. So if the artist is making nothing, what are, what's happening to our managers? Uh, our songwriters, like James mentioned, if the songs that are coming out aren't being streamed as much and they're not, you know, and there's not as many platforms for them to be heard, our songwriters are hurting, our producers will hurt. Um, and so the delays and the releases, this is going to be a trickle down effect, not just for right now, not for just today. A, a colleague of mine I was speaking with right when the pandemic hit, I was, I got hit with work because again, as James said, we were working on getting the stuff done, but we're a resource to our clients. So I was also spending equal time trying to figure out how do I help you find out how maybe you can, you know, if you have to take advances against royalty streams or go to music cares at the recording academy or find other grant programs or other assistance programs that might be out there just for you in the creative space so we did all of that while i was on the phone with a colleague going oh aren't you just so busy and he was like well i'm theater only like my whole practice is broadway and we were doing a deal because we were closing down a a a uh, play deal and uh, and he's like so I'm real busy now but in about two weeks I'm not sure what I'm gonna do so it affects everyone in that way and so you know what it's doing though and I was about to say the trickle down effect isn't for just right now because what's gonna happen is anything that stopped production and you know we talk about these film and tv pro you know things even though this is a music business how much is driven by the music that's in them right so it's relevant so if you shut down production on television shows that were going to air in the fall films that were going to come out top of 21 what's filling the gap well james i our colleagues were busy because we're finding people going into alternate things documentaries things that are already kind of content that can be created in fixed environments. You saw the voice even went to, everybody was on a Zoom call performing. I mean, adjustments are being made, but it's different so mm -hmm. fast. And so these numbers that you see going down in consumption, which in our business, that word consumption, people aren't doing it as much. They're not listening as much. They're not watching as much. They're not uh, going to the blah, blah, blah as much. All of that translates into dollars. Uh, for us, for our clients, and everyone around that business. So what we're 
everyone is having to do is quickly identify what are the alternate ways? What are the solutions? Um, I was asked to be on a brain trust of managers uh, Zoom call. It was beautiful to see all these managers of artists who are competitors came together and, and they wanted to know from myself, from other professionals, hey, what are you telling your clients? What are you guys dealing with? And talking with each other, which was beautiful about, and sharing, hey, what are you doing? If you do a virtual show, um, are you charging as much or are you not? Are you giving them a break because it's virtual or what are we doing? How are you pricing that? I mean, they just, you know, are you filming it and then shooting it out multiple places where maybe there's a bigger re revenue opportunity or are you doing everything live to still give people that interaction? And so there's a lot of adjusting going on um, that's, you know, going to hopefully make up for the drastic uh, numbers that we're losing in other areas. Hmm. You, you, Cornell, go ahead, James, you want to add to that? Can I chime in? Sure. Something she said there that's very critical is the artists coming together, the managers coming together, the attorneys coming together, the business managers coming together. That's what it's going to take right now. Everybody's got to come in the room and take away the I'm an A-list, you're a B-list, you're a whatever list. Take all of that away. Quincy Jones said it best when they did We Are The World. Leave your egos at the door and everybody come in this room for a common cause and figure out how we survive right. as an industry. The executives, the artists, the managers, the lawyers, everybody, music, TV, or film, come together and figure out how we can have a concerted effort. I love what Timbaland and Switzer are doing with the versus battles. Heather, we mm -hmm. both had clients in versus great. battles every yeah. Sunday or whatever. I mean, it's just incredible to see what they're doing to get over a million people coming out collectively for the various baby face and Hezekiah Walker and who else? Teddy and Riley and so yeah. on, Kirk and Fred this Sunday. We need to see more of that coming together. A, because it keeps morale alive. We need hope right now. People need hope and music and entertainment provide that hope. When everything is going crazy, people go to a Beyonce concert, I go to a Kirk Franklin concert, and your whole hope and morale is picked up by the flow of those concerts. So one of the reasons we want them to come together is to keep that hope, even during COVID-19, even during Rest in Peace George Flood and Aubrey and all the other cases we know of. We need that reason, and we also need it for the reason of just economic sense, bringing everybody yeah. together just so that financially we can um, withstand this kind of dry spell, this kind mm -hmm. of season that we all have gone through since, my mother told me now, it's been 95 days, Heather, does that sound right? Since this started, COVID? Oh gosh, it's been about that, yeah, that sounds about right. We've been kind of mm -hmm. under lockdown as a country. Yeah. And I didn't realize until she said last night, she said, you know we're in day 95. Mm. Wow, yeah, that time yeah. has seemed like it's on fire. People coming together. Yeah. Yeah. And I, what I love about what James said is that in coming together, I'm thinking and well, I know that I think it's also going to take it's going to take the creatives in a new direction. I'm sure during this time, our creatives, our writers, our producers, our artists are thinking of different ways to express themselves. They're thinking of, um, you know, you think about like the 60s and all of the songs of the time. Right. People people sang about social injustice. People sang about um, unity and coming together and, uh, and solving the problems that were in the world and just love and optimism and things like that. And I look at, you know, I, I, I'm honored to be able to be a part of a movement that's begun with a new client of mine, this young man, Keydron Bryant, who sang the song, I Want to Live, that his mother wrote, and that's gone viral. Um, and to see a 12 year old evoke an emotion and words of a black mother being sung that just transcended not only people of certain races, but socioeconomic backgrounds of, I mean, if it didn't, it touched everyone. And having voices like that and words like that starting to come through the music that we create, um, I think it's going to ultimately make this industry a better place. I think it's going to give us um, a new way to unify. I think that you know we can pick it and protest. We've done it forever, 
we can um, take over some things economically, we can change things politically and systematically. But if we know one thing throughout history that we uh, can lean on in terms of being a unifying force, it's the arts, it's music. I mean, yeah. my mom met my dad, why? Because she went to a party because she wanted to hear a certain kind of music. <laughs> my mom loved black music. So she went where the black music was. Boom, hi, I'm here. Um, <laughs> so I think that, you know, our music will, I think, start to change. Uh, there be new voices of this generation. And I think that the fastest place for that to happen is within our industry. And I'm hoping that that's really going to be one of the great positives that come out of all of this. Because what we do know is that in times of struggle and in times of crisis and in times like this, which a lot of these are times no one could remotely fathom, um, what typically comes out of it is that we're all stronger and better somehow and have a different vision and a different level of consciousness of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, I love being a lawyer, but well, and I, I think, tell people, it's what I do, it's not who I am. Go ahead, James, I'm sorry. And Heather, your 12 year old, please say his name again, because I want to make sure everybody heard it. You said it real quick. Keith I love Ron the song, Bryant. it's great. I don't want to mispronounce it. Yeah, Keith, Keith Ron, Ron Bryant. Bryant. Mm -hmm. His mother, Janetta. What's Rose. powerful? about that song, Heather, and the lyrics, it's no longer us and them. We're all in this together now. You know, when we go to the Grammys, it's kind of like, oh, there's Jay-Z, there's this person, there's da 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 And you hear like a us versus them kind of thing. But now what COVID-19 has made us realize is we all the same. We all locked at home, hoping we can find our mask <laughs> before we go to the grocery store, hoping I got the whole doctor thing that comes down over your whole head, look like I'm about to of operate course. on a patient. We, we somebody mailed it to me, so I'm wearing it. Um, we all got I'm that Amazon kind of thing out. going on right now. So <laughs> Amazon out. There you go. <laughs> but we can't. There's no longer a us and them. We all in this together. And I think the protests on the back end of COVID now is more of us together. And us, we got to come together all across the board. So it's a um, it's a very reflective time. And we that are in the arts, we have the ability to channel people, whether through our broadcast clients or our music clients or our film and TV clients to really help galvanize people to do the right thing here to build wealth and to more importantly, take care of each other morally, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Those things are just as important, if not more important than just the economic thrust of this call. Mm. I, I've got to ask a question because, and this is just my personal interest, uh, on the outside looking in, um, for years, it seemed as if the urban music genre was always uh, separate and in some cases lacking uh, compared to the country music genre. Uh, being industry professionals, do you guys feel the distance in country, from country artists or pro uh, professionals versus urban? Is there, is there a gap there for you guys? Oh, there's a total gap and I like to point out being four hours from Nashville, I've said on countless panels how much I admire the Garth Brooks, the Trisha Yearwoods, the Randy Kravitz, all of those guys out in Nashville and everywhere around, they came together as a country music body, created their own association. They got a TV show on CBS that does well. They didn't wait on America to pull together. They pulled together and there's a real family oriented feeling when you see them on stage or you see them in interviews, I've been waiting for other uh, industries, gospel music in particular, to come together like that, where you see it as like, it's about us coming together and creating something where we all win. And we don't just have four or five people who go platinum, but we have 25 people who go platinum or more, but we gotta all come together. So to answer your question, I definitely see a gap there and I definitely see how smart they did it and how they understood the economic benefit. And we haven't been able to do that. Jay-Z is probably the first hip hop icon that really, really stepped up and said, I'm taking the mantle and I'm gonna be the voice of this generation, the voice of this movement and the voice of this industry. We haven't seen that with a hip hop artist on this level. 
we've seen them issue statements. We've seen them host conferences. We've seen them set up sports agencies and other different things. But Jay-Z is incredible because he's not afraid to be unpopular with his corporate billionaire buddies. And mm -hmm. that's what you got to be when you're A-list. You got to be willing to say, I don't have to be popular to be in this fraternity or sorority if you're a female. You have to be able to say, hey, I'm going to do what's good for the whole, not the 2% of us. And I think that's where the clash has been in other genres. The country music industry, they operate in that mindset. We're going to do what's good for the whole. And you see multiple, multiple well-selling artists over there. And you see multiple, multiple well-established financial people over there. Whereas if you look in our industry, we're hurting right now because only a few of us. I used to say, Heather, if I launched a plane to go to Africa, I could probably only grab 10 people on the gospel side and maybe 20 on the hip hop side who could jump on the flight with me and say, we're going to stay there for six months and feed kids and build shelters and do Habitat for Humanity. There are probably less than 30 people in our collective gospel and hip hop industry that could go with me for a year. Not a month, not a week, but just say I'm financially stacked enough where I can jump on this charter flight with you, James, and just come there and we just go build houses, feed our people, teach them education, teach them music, teach them rap, whatever. We don't have that because we haven't come together as a collective to say, let's do it for the 98%. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I'll get off my soapbox, but you hit a chord with me, Cornell, when you said that kind no. of music example, because I've used that example so many times on panels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Heather, would you, do you have anything to add? has done that. NBA yeah, just, I, I mean, um, I mean, James said it very well. I very much respect the country music industry. I've always, as has James, um, used them as a reference point for what can happen with a genre of music um, to stick together, but also empower from within. So they consume country music uh, industry, consume each other's music. They promote each other's music. They attend mm -hmm. each other's concerts. You can have two songs on the country charts. That's the same song, which is empowering a songwriter to the fullest because they don't have this, no, I, that song's out. I can't cover it. Um, they, they have dedicated uh, songwriters, though many of the artists are writers as well as our, our uh, hip hop and gospel and you know, R&B artists, but um, they really, really value the art of collaboration in the studio, live musicianship. I mean, it's, it's an industry that really truly feeds itself, if that makes sense. Um, and it's tremendously powerful as a result. You know, a lot of times if you just sort of go into uh, kind of again this political climate we're in and so forth and you think about how people will often talk about uh, black communities and where did black businesses go and that we don't support our own businesses and we don't have our own businesses and there's a million reasons why but there was a time when in black communities the local corner store owner was black the um, uh, service people in the in the area were black the teachers the it was an infrastructure that kind of fed itself, especially in a world where no one was trying to assist, if you will, right? And if anything, um, causing disadvantages more than advantages. And so it was, it had by, by need, uh, it was necessary that the community became self-sufficient. And I very much feel that the country music industry, whether the rest of us who maybe didn't know a lot about it, see a Taylor Swift who goes from pop and then goes back country to come in, you know, they're not waiting on that moment of, okay, who's going to allow the moment. They're not waiting on the moment of, oh, I'll get a feature with an artist and maybe that'll open some awareness. In the interim, they're taking care of their own. And that's really a lot of what we've been talking about today, uh, whether our own means within a black community, whether it means within a music industry community or subgenres within it. There are ways that people can first start and build a foundation within your own warm market. I mean, Amway is built on, multi-living marketing companies are built on, start with your warm market. When you're selling your soap or your <laughs> whatever your vitamin product, 
call your friends and family first, make them your clients first, make them work for you, and then they'll get customers based on their warm markets. The real estate industry is built on that. So it's not that it's just a black thing or we should take care of our own thing. It's you start with a strong foundation within mm. your warm market and expand and grow from there. Mm. Oh, so good, so good. <laughs> Look, I can go. So I, I have a couple more questions, but I, I mean, I'm, you guys are bringing up so many things that I can dig into it. But we'll be here two hours if I do. So I'm, I'm going to move it right along. But um, you you mentioned um, something so key, and you mentioned the country music artists. Both of you mentioned it, the country music music artists feeding from one another. Uh, yet and still, we find in our culture where somebody that doesn't really look like us can come into the urban music on a genre, uh, sing like us, dress like us, whatever, it's their thing, and do the same thing essentially that we do and make tens and millions of more dollars. What, how, how can we make sense of that? How, how do we make sense of that as, as, as a I community? Said, I'll tell you real quickly. I'll tell you real quickly. I sat with my 17 year old son yesterday. He goes to a private school here and he's a baseball player. His brother finished law school, but likes the same. So I told my 17 year old, I said, America is going to love your talent. You're a baseball player. They want to draft you. Your brother sings. He sang on the Dove Awards. They love his singing. But America doesn't love you. They love your culture, but they don't love you. So when you see a white person come over to our culture and sell 10 million records, it's because America loves our culture, but doesn't necessarily love our boys particularly our young black men, which is why I had the conversations with my two young black men yesterday, 125, 117, is to say to them, understand, they love your culture, they love your swag, but they may not necessarily love you. That's why we have George Floyd and we have all these other cases. And that is why I believe they can come over here and sell millions of records. That's why Eminem can do what he does and so on and so on. Mm. Heather, well, you may disagree, but that's what I had to tell my boys yesterday. Yeah. They're going to love your pitching. They're going to love your singing. And they're going to love you on Wall Street to my law school son. But just don't think they love you. And yeah. I have a friend who has a t-shirt he gave my son that says, they don't love your black. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Remember, they don't love your black ASS. He gave my son that t-shirt as he goes yeah. to work on Wall Street. Um, I definitely agree that that's an unfortunate reality that um, I think we deal with again, you know, yes, in music, but in everything, right? We're all, we're all taught that. Um, but I also look at it in another, from another perspective. And that is that because we know that, I feel like a lot of us take a very self-defeating attitude towards it and don't try or don't even move into certain directions don't come out of our box and go over there and use it or whatever. And what I mean by that is this. So my father um, taught me to play tennis when I was very young. And my, you know, my mom was not wealthy. She was a single mother. Um, and when she met my stepdad, you know, uh, there were just a lot of things that she couldn't do on her own. And a lot of things that probably didn't even occur to her to expose me to. My stepfather came in and started to teach me tennis and teach me the sport and also teach me the culture because there was a country club culture uh, that I didn't know anything about. And teaching me, like James said, they might like what you do on that court, but A, they ain't gonna like it when you beat their little girl, but there also doesn't mean you're gonna get invited for dinner, nor is it gonna mean they might want you here at the country club after your match is over. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons during that time. A, I got to see things I never saw before and, and decide on a certain uh, quality of life I might wanna have and a certain uh, environments I might wanna go. But also knowing that my mom, who I told you guys is Irish, could be sitting in the stands watching me play tennis and people come up to her and go, who is a little black girl on court too? Who where does she come from? And they don't know she's talking to, they're talking to my mother. Um, and go from that to, you know, just trying to break some barriers and do some things. It didn't make me stop playing. It did, but what he also taught me is if you're gonna come over here, you better be as damn great as you can be. You better not come over here without anything less than an intention for excellence. And so at some point, 
And I think it speaks to where we win a lot. We have a lot of examples in our culture of sports, entertainment, right? Arts. Uh, we excel. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter so much, right? The socioeconomics change, the fandom. Mm -hmm. uh, James said at the beginning, the celebrity of it all changes. Um, and and it's it people see it differently. But that celebrity usually comes from what? It comes from the excellence with which that person is doing whatever it is they're doing. I mean, in the Michael Jordan documentary, he talked over and over again about there was never a day he was not giving 100%, ever. And, and the thought of anyone else on his team not doing the same or thinking the same made him start scrapping with folks and, <laughs> and stuff. So I say that to say, I have a client, his name is Charles Jenkins. Charles Jenkins is, was a pastor, a gospel singer, performer, uh, number one songs, billboard uh, charts, number ones, uh, all kinds of things, very accomplished, even some R&B songs, even some other things. He's written a country music song called America, who's sung by a guy named Adam Cunningham, who's a country singer from Nashville, who, uh, was on The Voice, who is killing the song, is written by someone most people don't know, the song is taking off. Why? It's an excellent song. It's sung by an excellent person. <laughs> and it's winning right now. And many people won't know who wrote it, right? Because of who's delivering it. But he wasn't scared to step outside the box. He wasn't scared to go outside the norm. He had a song that unifies the country. It And... Uh, was sung in a genre that he does not perform. So, uh, you know, to get someone who would perform it well and do it the justice that his creative mind uh, felt it needed is genius. And he's pulling off something that, I don't know, I would venture to say, and I work with amazingly creative people, um, they haven't thought about. Wouldn't occur to them to try to do. Uh, and so it's really about pushing the envelope. It's really about taking some chances. And at the end of the day, whatever it is, it's doing it with a level of excellence so that you have a shot to begin with. And I know everyone, anyone who's watching, James, you, Cornell, you, your parents told you, you got to do things 10 times better, right, than them. So in order to just get an average result. Um, and so I do think that's also part of it. Hmm. Wow. Well, we're going to prepare to wrap, but in, 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 Cornell. oh, go ahead. Cornell, I wanted to chime in. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me, Cornell? Yep. Oh, I think I, okay. No, I want to chime in. I, I thought of a story when, when Heather was talking um, a few years back, may she rest in peace. I was at a concert with Aretha Franklin in New York. Elton John does a big AIDS awareness event in New York for the AIDS Foundation. And Ms. Franklin, a client of mine in the latter years of her life, asked me to come with her. And what was amazing to me, Cornell, was that as we walked the room, you had Robert Kraft in there, who owns the Patriots. You had people from the Jets organization all over New York. And Bill Clinton walks up to me. He says, you know, I grew up on this music. And this music right here is the music of my childhood. And he was like a little kid in a candy store. And what reflected for me was, this is the 60s that he's talking about. And you think of what we're going through right now with George Floyd, multiplied several times over in the 60s with the marches and segregation and the three assassinations. And for him to say that to me, I look now at what we're going through and I had countless talks with um, I call her Miss Franklin. Miss Franklin, about this, she sent me pictures of her with Coretta Scott King and things they talked about back then. And what you realize when you ask that question about how can white people come into our music and why are they so enthralled with our music? Music is that force that unites them all. I'm standing here with a former president who's telling me what Aretha Franklin means to him and taking pictures with everybody at my table and you know, excited about the Aretha thing. And I'm realizing, wow, our music is bigger than tension, is bigger than race, is bigger than all that's going on if we unite and help build an economic base and help really, really use the power of this uh, consortium of music and artists and clients. And we don't always do that. And we have to 
kind of figure out a way to bring all that together mm -hmm. to kill the spirit in this country right now, as well as figure out how we can empower more people. That's, that's how I see it. And to your question, that's why they love our music. It wow. has that effect. <laughs> And we can't say Aretha without saying chain, 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 chain of fools. I mean, think of this music, like Billie Holiday with a Strange Fruit. I mean, this is what goes on with music in relation to George Floyd and the climate in the country right now. Hmm. I'm going to ask this, and this is, this is really my big question for you guys. And I think it's important for all of us, whether you're an artist, a consumer, or a professional. Um, the music industry is a billion dollar industry. Um, and many who mm -hmm. truly profit from it don't look like us. How can we as artists, one, uh, better position ourselves to get a bigger piece of the pie? And two, how can consumers better support artists so that they can see their worth in, their, in the financially speaking? Mm -hmm. I'm chomping at the bat. Uh, I'm chomping oh, at the bat. I thought it was your turn. I was yeah, I, no, I, I'm mm -hmm. more than happy to start because I have a feeling it'll be a little back and forth on this on how much time we got. But um, the first thing that especially the creatives need to do is freaking decide they want to understand the business of what they do creatively. Um, I almost start, every time I speak, I start by asking you know, who's in the room, who am I speaking with, artists, managers, indie label owners, producers, who, who are you? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I asked them, how many of them have ever had a job? Anything. I don't care if you work for McDonald's. I don't care if you had a corporate job. I don't care if you drove for Uber. It doesn't matter. Any sort of a job. And pretty much, you know, depending on the age of the group I'm speaking with, uh, pretty much everyone in the room raises their hand. And then I say to them, when you went and applied for the job and had your first interview and before you accepted the job, at any of those jobs, did you not know what you were going to make? Did you not know that you were going to get paid $7 an hour, $50 an hour, uh, that you were going to have this many taxes taken out, that you were getting paid every Friday uh, or every other Friday? I mean, you knew. You knew when your check was coming. You knew how many deductions you took off. You knew what it was you were going to get paid. So then I asked them, so of you who are in this business to make money, how many of you know where your money comes from? And I'm just trying to tell you, it is an epidemic <laughs> that so many of our creatives don't have a freaking clue. Maybe they know kind of, maybe they know obviously shows is pretty straightforward, live performance, pretty straightforward, um, although that's about to change. But when it really comes down to if I'm a writer, if I'm a producer, if I'm an artist, if I'm a background singer, if I'm a musician, how do I get paid from all of these places that I can't even see from streaming and digital and satellite radio and all of these things? If I'm a writer, why don't I know that there's probably eight, nine, 10 different types of revenue that I need to be checking for? Why don't I know that my royalties should be coming monthly or quarterly or semi-annually? And why am I not checking the daggone dashboard to see what that is? I'm my own label, my record is dropping. Hey, my new record's out. Why don't I know that I probably should have promoted it so somebody knew? I'll have people call, yes, yeah, so I've got a record coming out. And the first thing I ask them is, what does it mean? What does that mean to you? You have a record coming out. And are you paying? I mean, let's think about this. I'm going to let James go because we'd be able to do this part all day. Because uh, we get paid if you get paid. So if you don't know how to get paid, we are not happy. That's your lawyer. <laughs> so if you're an artist and you make a record independently, as so many of ours do, and you put that record out, but you had no idea you were supposed to pay your producer or your songwriters or anybody else involved and you didn't know what you were going to make. How much worse are you than Warner Brothers when you say they're, you're, not, you're getting the short end of the stick? When you're the artist with an independent project and you're paying no one that contributed to it. Why does that happen? Not because they're trying to hose everybody or each other. They don't know. And so until I know that these people know how to make their money, and take it seriously to understand the business of their music 
as they would their job at McDonald's, then I don't know how you go further than how do we deal with the disparity of the bigger companies make all the money? Oh, because half the artists don't even realize it. James? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hey, sorry. hey you, you nailed it. <laughs> no, you, he's hitting a chord with both of us. Cornell, <laughs> let me say this because I know time is late. But what I ask artists when they come in my office, I say, do you know the nine cent rule? And they go, huh? What are you talking about? I said, the nine cent rule, the copyright law. You said you were a songwriter. You said you were an artist. Do you know anything about nine cents, nine pennies? And they sit there, no, no, no. So I do two things. I pull out a sheet paper and I say, uh, 112 went double platinum on their first album, 2 million copies. Hypothetically speaking, I think it was like 4 million, but they sold 2 million copies. If they wrote one song and they get nine pennies for every CD that sells, they would be looking at about $182,000 for that one song. Nine cents times a million, 91,000. Nine cents times 2 million, 180, 182,000. The Copyright Act is like 0. 0.00091, but I just say nine cents to round it off to make it simple in their head so they can remember it. And usually 99% of the time, if not 100, the client or the prospect client says, I had no clue about that rule. So what that tells me is they don't know where their money comes from. Then I ask them, do you know about Spotify, Pandora, YouTube? Do you know the rates of what they pay? Oh, we don't know that. We don't know that. Then I ask them, and this is self-serving, but I give it to them for free. So it's not self-serving. I say, have you read my book? The Business of Urban Music. There's a whole chapter on publishing. And they say, no, I haven't read it. So I thank you for holding that. You're supposed to do that to get it, man. That was I in know, our contract that he was going to plug it four times. Heather, we're going to sue this guy. He didn't plug the book four times. What is he doing? But I give them a copy of the book for free, just even if they don't hire us. And usually when I do interviews like this, I mail out copies. All the money went to our halfway house. We made no profit off the book. All the money went to our halfway house. We had a couple of halfway houses. So I'm amazed at how they don't know Pandora, Spotify, YouTube, the nine cents rule. I then ask them, do you know the standard rate for a manager? Do you know the standard rate for a business manager? Do you know the standard rate for a role manager? I have well-known, well-known hot hip hop artists and gospel artists who don't know any of these rates. And they've been out here for a minute. They're not 21. They closer to 31 or 41. And I'm very frustrated that they're not reading. They're not even reading my book. And I'm that man, I'm that dude. I can't get them to read. So it's like frustrating because my whole approach is you shouldn't be calling me as much in three to four to five years. If I've done my job right, I say this about parenting. People call me all the time about parenting. I raised four kids, they're doing phenomenal. And people ask me about parenting and I say, parenting is a job where if you do a good job, you work yourself out of a job. If you yes. do good parenting. That's when you know you've done good parenting. When the kids don't call you every week, they buy their houses, they do what they do. You've done a good job as a parent when you've worked yourself out of a job. So as a lawyer, I try to almost work myself out of a job if I've educated you right mm -hmm. the first three to five years. You shouldn't need me on every single production agreement because I got a, a bunch of other patients that we got to tend to. We try to get you in here, get you healed and send you on your way because we got others coming behind you. Heather and I can't even service all the clients we're getting because it's so many out here that won't read. They won't read a contract. They won't read a royalty statement. They won't look up these rates for Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube. So it gets very frustrating. And I have a book where there's a mechanical license agreement in the book. So if you license your song, you can take the agreement outside of the book and use it. But you yeah. want to pay me $500,000, whatever, to negotiate that license. And mm -hmm. I'm looking at you like, hey, it's in the book. Yeah. What am I missing here? Yeah. And so by I'm the sorry, way, I'm right frustrated. Now, that was no, that was fantastic, James. And by the way, you know, there are those who do figure it out, right? Um, yes, there James, are. James has mentioned Jay Z a lot on the call on this uh, call because that's a fact. That's an artist that understood the business, understood how it worked, and turned it into all that it could become, right? Um, I have the honor of representing a guy named Matthew right. Knowles who raised this young lady named Beyonce and who came from a corporate and business background and made sure that his daughter and her friends understood how this business worked and how to build the empire and how to see beyond just the, ooh, my outfit was cute. What am I wearing on the album cover? And, uh, you know, doesn't that song sound good? I'm on the radio. I'm famous now. Um, I have right. kids, clients like 
one that a couple that a lot of these plaques are from that started out asking me, can I just have questions? I, I don't really have a lot of money. I'm just making beats in my basement, but I want to be a producer and I want to know how the business works. And exactly. you know, I want to ask you questions. What does that cost? And I said, well, your tennis shoes cost a whole lot. So you're going to find a <laughs> consultation fee to sit down with me and have a conversation. And if you can invest in your feet, you can invest in the person that's going to later be on the team still almost 20 years later while you're doing this. And now our conversations are actually as if I feel like I'm talking to another lawyer sometimes. He's so, uh, he's so well-versed and sometimes, you know, and he's on me now. It's the reverse, right? So there are those who are like, it's royalty time. Where's the, st where's the statement? Hey, right. Heather, what, what happened to, did they get that contract back? Right. Where's the, right? So yeah. we've got to yeah. be on top of our business because here's the reality to round it off and end this part of me running my mouth on this question, Cornell. And that's this. The question was, the, the companies make all this money and the artists and the creatives get the shortest end of the stick. That is a fact, by the way. Uh, it's a fact. Why? Because they spend the money to make the content and put it out and they're giving you a loan you never repay from your That's pocket. Right. You cannot right. go to Bank of America and get a small business loan for your food truck today and mm -hmm. not have the first payment be the first of July. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a business where it's high risk and those who are taking that risk make the rules. If in fact what you do is bet on yourself as so many artists can and will because of the technology, make their own projects, make their own music, be their own labels. Well, guess what? Now whose fault is it if you're not making any money? Because you can't figure out what the business is, where it's coming from, how to market and promote yourself and how to smartly invest in yourself even if you don't have millions of dollars. And that's uh, where uh. it's gonna change. Mm. Well, this has been awesome. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Heather, Heather is, Heather is just, she's a fireball. You know what you're getting. Andre. Look, I'm look Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Up. Eddie I Murphy. Got I got no vitamin D. My tan is gone. Like, come on. <laughs> hey, I ain't had a haircut in two months, Heather. I just I found mean, out look. this was a Zoom call. I found out this was see. a Zoom call at five minutes before three. I'm just glad we don't have to wear like dress from top to bottom because the same's on laundry and, and all of that. So you know, <laughs> well, you, <laughs> you know, y'all guys... got shorts on too. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Well, you guys are awesome. Um, I, I I can't pay you what you're worth, but but I, 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 next time I'm in town, I, I owe you dinner. That's I'll, I'll commit to that dinner to hey. dinner at Houston's. That's if they're allowing us in there still. I don't know, but um, you guys are hey, I'm awesome. I'm honored man. to be here. I'm honored to be here, and I thank you for bringing this attention to a worthy cause and just challenging us as a music industry to come together. Yeah. Heather, I think we should talk about doing more of these Q and A's and just giving away more information to yeah. empower our people because our people are hurting right now. We're Absolutely. fortunate that we're still working, but a lot of our clients and non-clients are hurting across this industry mm -hmm. significantly. So I'm in prayer for them, George Flood's family, our mayors, governors, our leadership. I'm in prayer for everybody that out of this, we rise like a phoenix and we don't consider to continue to just, you know, burn down stuff and sit in unrest, but that we rise like a phoenix and do what's right here. Be the change. Be the change. Well, you guys, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you. Now I'm going to release you guys back to your work. I know you guys have got a million things. Before to do. we get fired by everybody. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I'll see you guys soon. Thank you. Love you all. Love you both. Thank you. Yes, yes, Good sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> get the book. James Heather. Walker Jr., The Business of Art. <laughs> James, you, you, I think you gave me this in two, 2009, I think it was. I still have it. Somewhere yep. around there. I hope you read it. Yep, yep. Okay. I did. I did. Thank you so much for having us. Awesome. No problem. Heather, thank you so much, James. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.